Okay, so you can see here we've got a plan of the building we've been working on that is hopefully a little bit more accurate than the drawing that we had last week. And uh, so I've got a plan uh, of each level and then we've got uh, a couple of sections as well. I'll just open up the other section. Okay, so they're architect drawn and should be really accurate uh, or at least as accurate as we need them to be and uh, also the formatting should be pretty good. So I want to replace the drawing we were uh, inserting last week Oops. in the Revit file. So I'm just going to open up that Revit file. And so there it is. So that should be a fairly straightforward process, but I'll just go through the steps again. It will really just be repeating the steps from last week, but it's a good chance to just maybe go over things a little bit. And then maybe just give you some pointers on how you can then work with the, particularly the sections, using AutoCAD. And it's a good chance to go over the way PDF files work in AutoCAD. So I think last week uh, the file, I actually don't remember, did the file begin as a JPEG or did I show you how to convert it into a JPEG? Converted it from in Photoshop. Oh, good, good. Okay, so I'll just be repeating that. So here's the, the file I gave you last week, it, and if you haven't got those, they're in the folder on the P drive. I should all be on Moodle as well, but there it is. And okay, so that's a JPEG file. And so the files that we need to convert are PDF files. So while Revit's doing its thing, I'll switch to Photoshop and just go over that process quickly again. So if you're not sure, to make a JPEG file from a PDF, by far the easiest way is to use Photoshop. You can export JPEGs from Acrobat, especially Acrobat Pro, will do it, but it's a much more cumbersome process than using Photoshop to do it. And normally when you are doing this, you'll want one sheet at a time. Uh, and, and Photoshop's perfect for that. So again, I'm just going to go to Open in Photoshop and then choose the PDF file. And everything, of course, is running slow today, but here we are, there it's working. Okay, so we'll just start at the beginning of the first file there, number 8. And then you'll see a dialog box with a resolution. Okay, now, notice that it's got a page size here, and that should be something that's pretty familiar to you by now. Good old A3. 420 by 297, or close enough, in millimetres, and then the resolution is 300. If you, if you find that it doesn't have enough detail, you can increase that resolution, but remember it's going to make a big difference to the file size. Just to show you what the difference would be, well, I'll, I'll let you have a guess first. I oh, know it's too late, it's showing you. Maybe you didn't see that, so I'll, I'll ask you, what do you think would happen if I changed that from 300 to 600? You'd think it would be double, wouldn't it? But it's double in each direction. Remember, we're dealing with an area here. So it's four times. So it's 50 meg at the moment. Going to 600 dpi makes it 200 meg. So every time you double the resolution, you're quadrupling the file size. So just be careful with that. So I'm going to leave it on 300. You'll see as computers get better and printers improve, resolutions will get higher though. Alright, so then you can see there, because we've opened from a PDF that was probably um, generated using AutoCAD, it comes, in, it comes in with the line work cut out, and that's a good thing. But when we save as a JPEG, we'll lose that. So don't worry about putting a white background in or anything like that it'll automatically come if we just save as a JPEG. 
And to make your life a little bit easier, I will save these into the folder here. And I think I might just keep the same file names even. So there'll just be a JPEG copy of each one. Right, so notice it just showed us there with the white background. Um, okay, so again, just to go back to the image size there. Okay, so you can see there that is A3. And what you should always check is that the sheet size is meant to be that. So here, zooming in, in the title block, you can see there, you should always have this on your own title blocks as well, by the way. The scale that it is at a certain page size. It's no good just having a scale and not telling people what the page size is. So that's a little tip. Um, and uh, not, not all firms do this, but, but they should. We do. <laughs> yeah, you should, yeah. Okay, so then, if we insert that, with any luck, we can just scale it by 100 and it will be the right size. But uh, you still need to check. So I'm just going to go to insert image, find that file. Uh, sorry, I saved it into P, didn't I? Uh, what am I looking for? Discom 3. Yeah. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, or some sort of raster format. You can't insert PDFs. So that's, that's why we're converting it. Okay, so you can see over here, it's come in with a fairly arbitrary size. So all I'm going to try is just changing that width and height, typing in an A3 size, so 420, and then I'm going to add two zeros to make it 100 times an A3. Does that make sense? So it's 42,000 millimetres. Okay, so that's a real trick you can use. And it often will mean you don't need to scale things manually. So in properties, I'll just undo that and show you again. Okay, so when you select the image, you should see in properties it'll have a width and a height. And you can type in any value there, so I'm going to type in 40, which is the width of an A3 page, and then add two zeros to that to make it 100 times the width of an A3 page. Enter, and notice how it looks pretty good already. So, I mean, remember that method I showed you last week, because if you don't have an accurate size, you can always scale that way. But luckily, like I said before, we've got the boundary dimensions there, which should be pretty accurate. So I'm going to measure one of those using the measure tool here and go from the centre of that boundary line to the centre of the other end of it. 9403. 9396. That's close enough. 7 mil off. I think that's fine. Okay, so that's pretty spot on. I think that's more accurate than you'll get by scaling it manually. Okay, so it's around the wrong way. It's fairly easy to just select that. And you can either use the... Uh, oh, we'll just use the rotate tool to rotate it. So here you've got the rotate tool. I'm sure you've all used this one. Start with the baseline in any direction and bring that around 180 degrees. So that's now rotated the right way. We've got the image down here, which is pinned. So I'm going to unpin that and delete it and then drag my new one and just line it up by eye we're going to have to adjust things anyway so I might say the back corner is the one I want to keep and now you can see how far off that original drawing was then now we've got a chance to adjust it and make it alright maybe it's easier in fact to have that corner, no I think this one's going to be off, uh, and okay, so this is something that you will find in real life, but for student projects, I would ignore, uh, and that's the, uh, the slight angle in the wall here, so 
So that's technically correct, and you should always show that. If you're designing something for a real building that's going to be built, I can tell you having built a lot of things from uh, the boundary, that you need to follow the boundary very precisely. But for this project, you can just change it to a right angle. Yeah. And the same here. So that will be at a slight angle. Just make it a right angle though, or you're just creating work for yourselves. So you've got to use your judgment there. And um, oh yeah, so remember, once you put a floor in, uh, it wouldn't hurt to put one in now, just do a quick floor. So I'll do this pretty quickly. Hopefully you're all used to making floors. Clicking on the floor tool. I'm just going to leave it with pick walls and just go around using tab to get all of those walls. And then trim. I've just got a very quick floor that goes underneath all of those walls. Tick to finish. So you can see that, of course, the floor is going to cover that floor plan. Uh, so, well, I'll ask you, what do you think you'd do then to make it visible again? Oh, this chain. I might do that again in a minute. So, uh, okay, so I'll, I'll do floors again in a minute, but uh, I just want to get you thinking about how you can make things show up if they're not showing. And uh, so you're saying you can hide, you can unhide and do things like that. But here you've got the wireframe option if you go to graphics properties or graphics mode. So you can just set it to wireframe. That'll make the floor see through. But then there's a little trick there with the walls. Notice how the walls are black and it's really even hard to see where they are because the floor plan is black as well but zooming in there you can see there's the wall so to make the wall see through I'll go to a location where it'll make a big difference okay see so here when I make the wall see through I should be able to see the plan underneath as well uh, and there's a real secret there the walls are black if you remember because of this coarse fill option. So a little trick that I've worked out you can use to make them see through is just to set them to fine, which will turn off that coarse material option and you shouldn't have another material assigned so then they're see through. It's, a, it's, it's not going to be like that in the other original ground floor plan, they're still black, but in this one that we're working in with the image, everything's nice and see through and easy to work with. Okay, so that should be a pretty good setup for the for the plan. I'm just going to select it and make sure it's pinned. So it won't move anymore, and then I can just line everything else up with it gradually. Take your time with this. If you get the setup right and neat and organised, it'll just make your life much easier when you go to put in all the other elements. So the first thing before you even worry about the internal elements or even the floors, which I will go through later, uh, I will be spending a lot of time just getting these reference planes lined up and then the external walls lined up with those so everything's uh, coordinated and organised and then uh, make sure you set up each level that way so I know you're probably going to look at changing the internal floor plan for each level but I don't know have you been uh, has it been suggested to you that you could maybe keep some of these internal walls no? You're just going to gut the whole building? Yeah, got it. Got it, okay. Because uh, I was going to say, it can really help to have... Well, okay, so really you don't need to have any more than one of the extra floor plans then, but you'll still need one. So you've got the ground floor, but you've got the, um, the entry door there, and then you've got the, um, the floor plan for the next level, where you can see the windows, and I'm sure you're not going to be changing all the windows, so the windows are different and of course the entry door isn't there. So it's worth having at least one of the floor plans but then you can see that the, uh, the next floor plan is identical on the uh, you know, exterior walls and the interior. Again you're going to remove so that doesn't matter. So at least have the same setup for level one. So you know duplicate the view, right click, duplicate with detailing. Yeah, yeah, and then insert 
um, a JPEG copy of the floor plan into the new copy, yep, and, and have that ready to work off and then you can tell straight away if there's anything out of place. Uh, so I won't go through those steps, I'm sure you can do that. And then for the sections, like I was saying earlier, I wouldn't insert them into Revit. At first I used to, but then I found it's really um, just going to get in the way and, and not really going to be easy to measure from anyway. So you want to have the sections to work with while you're in Revit and check things you know, in your interiors and, and do all the work you need to there. But you don't, don't need to really trace these sections. There's not a lot of information there other than the heights. So what I thought I'd show you instead of bringing them into Revit is how to bring them into uh, AutoCAD. So I've already inserted the plan just so you can see what will happen with PDFs. Now this is that file inserted into Photoshop, same file. I'll show you the original PDF so it's a bit easier to look at. So you can see there we've got obviously the plan with the site around it and then a title block. Notice how in AutoCAD it's missing the title block. So right away you can see it's changed when it was inserted into AutoCAD, something's happened. It's all to do with the way AutoCAD reads PDF files. And it doesn't read everything. Also, you can't edit them. So if I select this, you'll see there's no option to explode it. You can clip it, but that's about it. So it's limited what you can do with PDFs in AutoCAD. And again, it's all just to do with the arrangements Adobe have made with Autodesk. But at least you can insert them into AutoCAD, so unlike Revit, you can't insert PDFs into Revit at all. But when you insert a PDF into AutoCAD, if it's been made as a vector file, and chances are this one has because it was probably drawn in AutoCAD originally, then you can trace endpoints and midpoints and all of those things that you get with AutoCAD objects. So that can be useful, but that's about all you can do. You can't explode those lines, you've got to draw new lines. Um, but then also you can measure really easily off these as well, unlike the JPEGs where we're just guessing um, which pixels to, to measure. When you're measuring from a PDF in AutoCAD, it should be a lot more accurate. So I'm going to make a new drawing, and AutoCAD ISO is going to be the template. I'll just show you how easy it is to bring a PDF into AutoCAD if you haven't done this before. On the Insert tab, just go to Attach. And then choose the file you want to insert. So this should be one of the sections. And then I'm going to leave these options turned off. So when you insert things in an AutoCAD file, you usually have these options to specify either the scale, insertion point, or rotation on screen. So all that means is you use the mouse to choose those options. So if I turn that one off, I've got insertion point um, specify on screen turned on, so that means I need to click a point to place the object. I'll turn that off too. So I've got none of those tick box turned on, which means it'll go at zero, zero, and the scale will be one to one, in other words it'll be its original size. I've got no idea what that is, but we'll find out in a minute. Click OK. And I will double click with the wheel, or another option would be to um, choose zoom, and then right click again and choose zoom extents. So there's my section. But how do we know what the size is? Yeah, I can measure something. That's, that's really the best way. You'll see it's got the title block. Notice how with the, the plan, for some reason it didn't, but this time it does for the section. It's just different formatting. Um, so I'm going to go to Properties and look at the size there. And you can try and use that method I showed you before, making it a size based on the paper size. And then I'll add a couple of zeros to make it 1 to 100. 
Zoom out and let's have a look. So we've got a scale bar there as well. We should be able to measure that. I'll try that. So you've got the measure tool in AutoCAD. DI is the shortcut for distance if you want to use that. So you can see there that's closer up to 500. I'll be pretty sure that's what that should be on the scale bar. Let's have a look at one of these levels here. So from level 1 to level 2 is 4481. I'm just going to type CAL to bring up the AutoCAD calculator and put in the height that we have there, so 15745 minus 11260. Enter, and let's compare those numbers. So the distance should be 4485. That's my maths as well. Let's just make sure I've got the right numbers there. Yes, I think I do. And the distance is 2998. So it hasn't worked, setting the sheet size. And again, it's probably because of the way PDFs come in. It's cropped that page. You can see there it's actually, it has, it's cut off. I don't know, don't know what's happening there. just my eyes or is that changing as I zoom in and out? It is, isn't it? Yeah, so there's something unusual happening there and again PDFs do work in a strange way when you come into AutoCAD. So if it doesn't work when you try to set the, uh, the sheet size then uh, you need to scale it manually. So again really all of this is showing you that you need to be on top of the scale and be able to check that the scale is correct and if it isn't uh, make it correct. So again, these are the numbers we need. It needs to be, uh, what was it again, 4485. And, uh, oh no, sorry, this is a different distance. It's 4481, it's actually pretty close. So I was looking at the wrong distance there. But let's just double check that. So I'm gonna make sure by measuring again. I'm still gonna change it, but it's not gonna be as big a change as, as I thought. Yeah, it's only marginally off. So it did work actually setting the sheet size, but again, not exactly. So 4482, and it should be 4485. Now say I'm being super fussy, and I want it to be exactly 4485. You can do it. And this method will work with anything in AutoCAD. So you might want to note this little formula down. It's a pretty easy one to remember as well. But you know, sometimes just writing it down will make you remember it. That's my own little formula. Well, I probably didn't invent it, but anyhow, I worked it out. So I've just gone to the scale tool on the modify panel. So scale, and then I'm going to select the PDF, press enter, and then it'll ask for a base point. Now, the base point really can be almost anywhere, but in this case, I'm just going to use the origin, which is 0, 0. And then, when it asks for the scale factor, this is when you type in my little formula, which is the size you want it to be over the size it is. So the size we want it to be is 4485. Oops. 4485 and the size it is is 4482 that's it that will work with anything using a photocopier that method would work so it'll work in Revit too so if I press enter it's only changed very slightly but I'm going to prove to you that it has now made it perfect by measuring now between these two lines doesn't matter the me measuring diagonally by the way if you're not sure in AutoCAD how that works when you measure a distance in AutoCAD it measures 
the direct distance, but then also the delta distance. In other words, the vertical and the horizontal distance. So it's here, 4484.41. So yeah, you could make it even more accurate if you want to, if you want to go down to half a millimeter. No builder is ever going to build that accurately for you, but it can make a difference, believe it or not. It's when you're measuring things, just in terms of having round numbers. So let's do that extra little bit. So you've got to use an extra trick, which is good for you to see here. So I'm going to use scale again. So it's 4484.4. So let's make that work. Again, I'm probably being way too fussy here, but it's good just to see the method. So my scale factor then is it's still 4485, but I'm going to add a zero because AutoCAD can't deal with decimals in fractions. So do you remember shifting the decimal place in whatever maths you did? So that's all I'm doing here. So I'm just shifting the decimal place one space to the right. So 44850 over 44844. Right, because I wanted to use that number with the decimal place, but obviously have the decimal place not there. So now let's try that measurement. So you see this method will be much more useful when you get drawings that aren't done by an architect. There we go. So, looking now at my direct distance, it's the diagonal distance there. I don't care about that. It's the delta y, that is the vertical distance, 4485.012. So a tenth of a millimeter off, um, or not even, what is it? Sorry, that's a hundredth of a millimeter off, and uh, I'll live with that. Okay, now what I do then is save this file, and I will save this file so that you can open it. But make sure you know how to do this because you'll be constantly getting resources uh, from different places for your own projects and you'll need to get them to a uh, workable scale. So let's just call this section one. That'll do. So I'll just keep that open while I'm working in AutoCAD, while I'm working in Revit. Have that ready in AutoCAD and I can just measure off. So say I want to have these, want to retain the beams. And you might have to. Uh, you know, from a structural point of view, there's a good chance that you will have to have have those there, or at least have something you know that's dealing with your structure. And uh, so, if you're not sure then what the height of those is from, say, the floor level, you can easily just measure in the AutoCAD file. There it is. So, 1900. Well, that's not really going to be very good if you've got to have a floor under that, but then we can say, well, really, it's down to this sloping thing, uh, which is down there, I suppose, and so from there, from the beam down to that, 2, 2.2, roughly. So you constantly, constantly want to be measuring from this drawing uh, other things like the, uh, the stairs here might help you to measure those. Um, the floor level of this landing, all those things uh, can be really helpful. Parapet, definitely, that's something you want to check. So all those things you can measure uh, without having to bring that into Revit. Okay, so can you see how that's going to be a helpful thing to have while you're working? Yeah, great, so, uh, yeah, so that's really all I wanted to show you there, and maybe I'll give you some time to, um, you know, fix your Revit file and uh, line everything up with the new drawing. And uh, after that, we'll go through floors, ceilings, and the roof tool, maybe a little bit more. And uh, so the other system family, well, I'll ask you, what's the other big system family? Uh, no, it's probably a technical thing, calling them system families, it's just the way I am. Walls, floors, and ceilings, so let's get out of there. Well, I like to think of them together because they define the shell of your space, usually. 
And so in Revit, the people who designed the program, they think of them differently as well, and they've made them system families, which means that they work differently to things like doors and windows, which you should be thinking about after you've got those um, enclosing elements set up. And then the other big one is stairs and ramps and railings. So stairs you'll see as well are system families. So I'll maybe go over those a little bit and then if we get time uh, we can start to have a look at the other kind of family, your loadable families, doors, windows and, and things like that. And they're what you'll use for your a lot of your design elements as well. But we'll probably go further into that next week, starting to look at model in place a bit more. And maybe as well next week, I was hoping we could start to look at the other main modelling method, just to get you thinking about things that aren't system families. Uh, have you had a look at mass modelling yet? No, so we'll start maybe on that as well. Because it's good to think about those defining elements. But again, next week we'll do that.